Hi, everyone. Um, looks like we have a fair and a good number of people who've joined. So I think I'll go ahead and get started since we're a few minutes after 11. Um, so I am thrilled today to introduce Professor Jelaine Arias joining us as our emerging scholar from UCSF, where she's an assistant professor at the Memory and Aging Center in the Department of Neurology. Professor Arias has a distinguished training record. She received her law degree from the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. And she also received a Master of Art in Bioethics from Case Western Reserve University. Additionally, she completed the Cleveland Fellowship in Advanced Bioethics at the Cleveland Clinic and completed the Atlantic Fellowship for Equity in Brain Health at the Global Brain Health Institute of UCSF and Trinity College. Professor Arias is a multidisciplinary researcher and scholar leading studies in legal and ethical challenges in Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative illnesses, and aging. Her research has identified employment and insurance discrimination based on a risk for Alzheimer's disease. She's evaluated genetic data sharing guidelines, examined challenges to financing long-term care, and characterized financial and legal decision-making in young onset dementias. Her current research portfolio includes an NIH NIA K01 award to develop employment and insurance anti-discrimination protections for individuals at risk of Alzheimer's disease and an NIH supplement award to evaluate private payer coverage policies for genetic testing in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Additionally, Professor Arias has obtained foundation grants to evaluate sentencing decisions for individuals with dementia and to develop guidelines for genomic data management and sharing specific to frontotemporal dementia research. Her publication record is impressive and crosses disciplines with publications in the leading legal, medical, and bioethics journals, capitalizing on novel research methods. So I am thrilled to welcome uh, Professor Arias today as an emerging scholar and to hear about her innovative and high impact research. So everybody, please welcome Professor Arias. Thank you, Christine, for the fantastic um, introduction. It's really wonderful to virtually be in the University of Michigan. Um, I only wish I had been able to join you guys in person and been able to really see your beautiful campus. But I'm really excited to put this work in front of this group. I think that there's a lot of overlaps um, with the group that, or the work that your group does um, and this project and really looking forward to some feedback and thoughts. This is a paper um, topic that I've been working on for some time, trying to really get a better sense of how I want to take the next step um, as I write up what, I'm, what I'll be discussing today. And um, I am happy to take questions throughout. So uh, Stacy will stop me if you drop something into the chat thing or raise your hand. Um, so please do not hesitate to interrupt. Um, I am happy to be interrupted. So typically and historically, we've really thought about the issues in employment and discrimination as something quite separate from the stigmatized version of what we perceive as Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Um, it was interesting to me actually, when I went to look for images yesterday to put on this slide of what dementia looks like. And if you do a Google image search, these are the type of people that you see who apparently have dementia, um, which obviously lacks some diversity, but obvious, and also puts dementia in this category where we really think about it as those who are older um, and really past the employment stage. However, there's really two trends that we have to consider when we think about why there's now an intersection of these issues. First of all, we know from evidence as well as um, even public reports that individuals are working later in life. There's a lot of reasons for this. So part of it is that jobs may be less physically demanding now than they used to be. People are also living longer. Um, there are different economic pressures to continue working past when we would typically see individuals retire. And additionally, they're starting to become this perception that it is beneficial beyond just the income to continue to work um, as long and as you can, including actually protecting your cognitive health. However, simultaneously, we're seeing this push in medicine broadly, but specifically in Alzheimer's disease to really be able to better identify and diagnose Alzheimer's disease and related dementias at earlier stages, including the use of biomarkers, which are coming now through the pipeline at a rapid pace in a lot of different forms, um, including imaging. Uh, we now have plasma blood-based biomarkers um, and the sort of original OG was our spinal fluid biomarkers that started it off. 
So what I'll be talking about today is really sort of how these three, these trends emerge together, because what we ultimately have is an at the average age of retirement or when individuals stopping to work um, increasing um, as we are being able to lower the age um, of diagnosis or disclosure of risk because our field is advancing in such a way that our technologies are allowing us to do that. And at the same time, as individuals work later, it's going to just naturally increase the likelihood and the prevalence of individuals developing chronic illnesses associated with age, including cognitive impairment, while they're working. So today, I want to provide for you a redefinition of Alzheimer's disease as the field now sees it. I want to talk briefly about the anti-discrimination protections under the ADA. I hope that I will be able to stay away from my legal legalese and be able to talk about this really at a policy level for you. And then really think about some of the policy considerations related to safety and burden to employers. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease um, is the most prominent and best well-known neurodegenerative illness that leads to cognitive um, impairment. It, what ends up happening really is that an individual's brain acquires uh, two proteins that have been commonly referred to as flax and tangles, now known as amyloid and tau. Those then lead to brain atrophy. And the, the atrophy in the brain is actually what leads to cognitive impairment. The average age of onset for Alzheimer's disease is 65 years old, um, and it affects approximately 5.8 million people in the United States. And that number is growing and changing as we get better at diagnosing. However, it's also important to understand that while a majority of individuals experience Alzheimer's disease or related dementias after the age of 65, there is a large cohort of individuals that have either early age of onset Alzheimer's disease or other young onset dementias. Um, early age of onset Alzheimer's disease affects those under the age of 65 and affects about 200,000 people um, uh, in the U.S. In the last decade or so, or probably two at this stage, we have completely reshaped and redefined how we diagnose Alzheimer's disease. It used to be that we would diagnose Alzheimer's disease according to symptoms, and then we would do a differential. And when I say we, I just mean the field. I'm obviously not a clinician, but Alzheimer's disease was diagnosed by the symptom onset. And then there was sort of this differential that they would go through to remove other potential causes, specifically anything that was reversible. And it was only after death that they would be able to confirm that um, confirm Alzheimer's disease at autopsy. In, the late 2000s, we were able to identify these biomarkers that um, I mentioned earlier, amyloid and tau through CSF fluid. Um, this then became identifiable through PET imaging. And this led to ultimately this redefinition in 2011, which reshaped Alzheimer's disease from being diagnosed first by symptoms to being first diagnosed by the biology itself. So now we look at Alzheimer's disease as the pathology and then the clinical symptoms um, as something separate, as a stage of the illness. So what this has led to is this cascade effect, if you will. So what we understand now is that individuals become amyloid positive um, about 20 years before symptoms emerge, um, after which we believe that that then kicks off a cascade of tau um, emerging, and then that then leads to the brain atrophy, which then leads to a cognitive decline, starting from normal, going through mild cognitive impairment through to the dementia stage. So what you then have now is not Alzheimer's disease as only a dementia, but you have Alzheimer's disease at three different stages. You have preclinical Alzheimer's disease where an individual is biomarker positive, but asymptomatic. Mild cognitive impairment where somebody has the prodromal stages of uh, the symptoms, so they might be suffering from initial memory loss, but they're able to maintain their independence and function um, fairly regularly in day-to-day -day life, all the way through the dementia stage, which is, this is what I think we stereotypically think of when we think of Alzheimer's disease. Of course, you know, here what we have to recognize is that the downside of these, this idea of being able to diagnose and identify Alzheimer's disease at earlier stages, particularly in the preclinical stage, 
is that it could lead to discrimination. So in uh, 2014, I, I launched into a study where we spoke to uh, physicians who were dementia experts, and we asked them about some of the discrimination risks that might emerge. And specifically, one of the issues that they raised was employment. Um, in 2014, we wanted to, Jason Carlos and I worked together wanting to understand whether or not there were sort of any general legal protections available that might help individuals who are preclinical Alzheimer's disease um, from being discriminated against both in the insurance and employment context. For purposes of today's talk, I'll be talking about specifically in the employment context. It's important to understand that in the context of employment, there really are two major laws that could have provided protection here, possibly three if you think about the Age Discrimination Act, which I have sort of analyzed out because it does not apply or wouldn't provide the protections that we need. Um, and the first is the Americans with Disability Act, where I'll be focusing my time, but I would be remiss to not mention the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So GINA, as it's commonly known, was passed in 2008. It prevents employers and insurer, health insurers from discriminating based off of genetic information. It does not apply in the setting of biomarkers when we're talking about a preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease, um, in part because biomarkers are inherently not genetic information. And in fact, work by Anya Prince and Ben Berkman show that there's also a possibility that once an individual becomes positive for a biomarker, they would then lose any protections that they might have had underneath GINA because that would constitute disease manifestation. So I wanted to talk just briefly about the Americans with Disability Act. Most of us are pretty familiar with this, but I find it important to just kind of recap some of the high level basics. So the Americans with Disability Act was passed initially in 1990 and then amended in 2008. The goal was really to protect um, discrimination based off of disability in all public settings. Um, there is a particular section that focuses on employment um, referred to as sort of Title I, and it prohibits discriminatory actions, which are really labeled as those types of actions that would be adverse to an individual and then provides for also reasonable accommodations. And this is the expectation that an employer would provide uh, solutions to help an individual with a disability be able to maintain their employment. And one of the first initial questions that we even have to come to is whether or not an individual within the Alzheimer's disease spectrum, either at the preclinical stage all the way through dementia, would really meet the requirements for protections under the ADA. So for that, sort of what lawyers call the prima facie case to be able to even kind of get in the door to be able to make this argument, the individual would have to argue that they are A, qualified, and B, that they meet the definition of disability under one of the three ADA prongs. So the three prongs are that you have an actual disability, I'll, I'll discuss what that means, a record of disability, or you're regarded as. We can eliminate record of because that prong really looks behind to say if you had a history of a prior illness, that would have manifested as a disability. So Christine, for you that we talked about this briefly, you know, history of cancer, for example, and then you have recovered, your employee cannot use that historical illness as a mechanism for discriminating against you. And you would qualify underneath that prong of the law. Um, so I wanna actually start at the preclinical stage and look at the regarded as prong. because I think it's actually really interesting to think about how this would apply to this population. So the regarded as prong says that basically, regardless of whether or not you have an actual disability or not, if your employer perceives that you do and then acts upon that, then you, you are entitled to recourse. And this would actually work really well for asymptomatic conditions, particularly for something where you have a preclinical biomarker. We see evidence of this in um, prior case law that shows that a genetic marker for cystic fibrosis in an education case um, or this obesity as a risk factor have been perceived as disabilities and provided for recourse. The problem is that, um, sorry, um, the problem with the regarded as claim is that you have to make that claim on a case by case basis. So from a policy perspective, if we were able to make an argument that preclinical Alzheimer's disease could be regarded as, you would have to demonstrate that the employer made their decision based on the presumption of their, their disability so that they you know, somehow learned of um, the preclinical Alzheimer's disease status 
and then decided to adverse, you know, make adverse employment decisions based off of that information. We were actually curious as to whether or not this idea of a preclinical biomarker would influence HR managers. So we conducted interviews. Um, and I will just say that this one quote here captures everything <laughs> that we found uh, his, uh, throughout the study. In fact, I, I described this data set as my impressively unimpressive data set because the consistency was reached so quickly um, that we ended up so like ceasing um, enrollment and, and sort of found saturation after nine interviews. But what was interesting is that all of our human resource managers that we spoke to, we gave them three hypothetical scenarios and we said, okay, you know, say this employee comes to you and or you find out this employee has a preclinical biomarker on their record in some way, whether it was through a Facebook search or information that they left out on their desk or it was explicitly disclosed to you, how would that inform your uh, decisions moving forward. And all nine of them said, it has, if it has nothing to do with their performance, it's irrelevant. And they actually felt some sort of um, need um, to provide some kind of protective behavior and or put protective behaviors in place. So guiding the employee to you know, protect that information or how to, how to, how to keep that confidential. Um, but on top of that, they also did recognize that while an HR manager has one particular role in the employee-employer relationship dynamic, um, that their, their fear was that it would actually be used by other stakeholders within the employment situation, um, and it would not be handled appropriately. So we heard this kind of thing time and time again of, this is how I would treat it, but I don't know that every HR manager is like me, and or additionally, I don't think that the HR managers are the ones we'd have to worry about. It's really the supervisor and peer colleagues. Um, and so again, something that we saw within our nine interviews pretty consistently. There's another challenge in the context of this population related to why the regarded as prong might not be sufficient. So under the regarded as prong, you have um, uh, as a plaintiff or somebody bringing a case forward, you would have the option to sort of bring the discrimination case, look for uh, repercussions for that, you know, back pay, these types of things. But what you cannot ask for underneath the regarded as prong is the reasonable accommodations. And this makes sense, right? Because the regarded as prong is really meant to assist individuals who don't have an actual disability, but have been perceived to be disabled from discrimination. And so to ask for reasonable accommodations, you really should be making the argument that you have an actual disability. And so what it creates for us is this scale between, you know, do we want to really focus on preventing discrimination or do we want to assure that these individuals as they develop through the disease process have access to re reasonable accommodations that might allow them and help them to continue working. So I think the most interesting place to look at this question actually is in the context of mild cognitive impairment and whether or not mild cognitive impairment would constitute a disability. So mild cognitive impairment is really interesting because individuals are at the, you know, can be anywhere from the very early stages of the disease all the way through just before they constitute sort of mild dementia when they really start to need assistance um, to live independently. And there's a lot of things that we can think about that individuals with mild cognitive impairment stages can continue to do to function in their daily life. And there's also benefits for, for them as individuals to continue working, right? There's the continued socialization, the continued use of their brain, there's consistency and behavior that helps um, really sort of support them. So if we wanted to make the argument that mild cognitive impairment was a disability, it's, it's probably pretty simple to do. We have to demonstrate that an individual has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of their major life activities. So we've seen this um, work in post concussive syndromes and also memory associated with di diabetes. The big question that comes in actually now that we have the use of biomarkers is, could we actually argue that biomarkers are a major bodily function or a reflection of major bodily function and are now protected underneath the ADA? So let me just give a brief history of why this might be important. So prior to 2008, there was a host of case law that looked at this issue of protections under the ADA for individuals with HIV. 
To my knowledge, it is one of the only asymptomatic type conditions where the um, ADA created a presumption based on case law um, that it would be a disability and it qualified as a disability. And the way that it was argued was initially because it would impede things like reproductive function, because if you have HIDD, you're unable to participate in that major life activity. But after 2008, the law changed, and with it changed our regulatory interpretation. And I apologize for getting into the legal weeds here, but it's important to understand that when that law changed, the regulations then listed HIV as a presumed disability. Additionally, they listed out major life activities um, that would also constitute a disability, including things like cancer, which affect your cell function. The other things that listed in that as a presumed disability are um, neurologic function and brain function. And one of the questions is, is could we make the argument that because biomarkers are a reflection of an increased um, accumulation of these proteins, that ultimately lead to your brain um, suffering from atrophy, that the biomarkers themselves constitute a disability. Um, I think that this is an argument that we could make. Obviously, it is based off of a lot of assumptions, um, but this will be the sort of the focus of future work is trying to figure out whether or not it actually fits and whether or not it makes sense. So let's assume that we can make the argument that an individual with at earlier stages of the disease process would meet the definition of disability either under the regarded as or under the disability, um, actual disability prong. The bigger question that I struggle with from a policy's perspective is, is the ADA really the right mechanism and how should we think about um, employer and safety considerations? So let's take, for example, this challenge around accommodations. So the, the law basically says that employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations, um, reasonable being those that do not lead to undue burden, including the economic impact. And so the question becomes, at what stage does an individual actually need accommodations and what types of accommodations would an individual with cognitive impairment need to continue their employment? Of course, it, this is gonna be different based off of the type of employment that they have, but you, um, in contrast to physical disabilities where you know, making sure that there's appropriate wheelchair ramps or providing assistance with um, audio visual. Um, this is a situation where your cognitive function is necessary at a different level for every job. So in some situations early on, I've heard um, caregivers say that they, their loved one was able to continue working through the assistance of post-it notes and additional reminders. And certainly this is something we hear when people report their story of how they started to recognize that something was going wrong is they felt the need to have additional reminders for things that they wouldn't have needed before. They were missing meetings because of um, their old scheduling or old calendaring approach wasn't working. Um, and those seem to be reasonable However, we know that this is a progressive illness. And so there's this question of how do we incorporate reasonable uh, accommodations when those accommodations will necessitate change over time. Um, and additionally, because it's, it's a slow progression, it's not, there's not gonna be like identifiable switch points that we'll be able to look to to identify at what point an accommodation becomes reasonable and at what point it doesn't. So if we require that an employer provides reasonable accommodations, you're asking them to continue to assess and evaluate those accommodations um, throughout the tenure of the employment. And then of course, there's this issue of disclosure. If we ask the employee to that they would, or if an employee would like reasonable accommodations, they then need to disclose their illness to their employer, which could create a new host of discrimination that they might not have been exposed to had they not asked for the reasonable accommodation. And while we can think that it's hypothetical to think uh, that discrimination would actually take place, we hear stories like this. So this individual, um, this is actually a story out of the UK. Um, he has a really a unique type of Alzheimer's disease called uh, post-cortical atrophy, PCA. It actually affects your vision. It's a, one of the early onset Alzheimer's disease that affects your vision before it affects anything else. So his cognitive you know, status is still pretty intact. Um, it's just that his vision is impaired. And he says that, you know, he was very qualified, previously would have gotten a lot of these jobs, went back on the job market, disclosed that he would need some reasonable accommodations. And as soon as he 
disclosed that the job interview sort of ceased at that point and he had been unable to get a job as, as a result. Then there's this question of how you measure whether or not an individual is qualified. So if we assume that an individual was hired pre-impairment um, stage, they were hired under one set of qualifications and then those, their ability to meet those qualifications will be declining through the progression of their illness. And so what you have to be able to demonstrate is that an individual is qualified for the essential job functions. And this really puts the individual in between a rock and a hard place because what they then have to argue is that they are cognitively intact enough to maintain their qualification for the job, but impaired enough to meet the definition of disability. And finally, the big elephant in the room for many of us is this issue about direct threat. So if an employee actually um, disability would pose a direct threat to either um, themselves or others, um, the employer can use that as a basis for ending the employment. And we see this really mixed history um, in case law regarding what is the burden of proof, as well as who is the actual decision maker. So do we say that it's reasonable and good faith by stuff of the employer? Is it a decision of fact that's made by the jury? Or do we look at it from a judge? And I think the most interesting and actually more exciting way to think about this is what we call the pilot scenario or our politicians, right? And I use these two examples because, you know, everybody points to a pilot like, okay, well, do we want our pilots? If our pilots had preclinical Alzheimer's disease, should they still be allowed to fly? Should the FAA be able to use that information during screening? So a former law student at UC Hastings and I took on this, this question and, and looked at the FAA structure for pilot screenings and how biomarkers would fit in. What we ultimately found is that pilot, the pilot issue is interesting in part because I think the question of whether or not somebody flying a plane, um, even in early stages of the disease is, is, is scary and, and, and interesting to think about. But also pilots, unlike most other industries, have a very specific age cutoff point that they're no longer allowed to work after. Additionally, because of the screening procedures that are already put in place, once a pilot turns 45, typically they are screened every six months as opposed to every year. And so if an individual were preclinical bio or preclinical um, in the preclinical stages of Alzheimer's disease, it would be, make sense to increase their cognitive testing at a higher sensitivity level um, across those six months to monitor their progression as opposed to um, you know, just being a flat the denial of their job at that point, assuming that they're in the asymptomatic stage. It's obviously very different when we think about it in the MCI stage. The other question is, is how do we think about some of the legal and policy challenges related to cognitive impairment in federal officials? So I wrote this with my colleagues in 2009, where we sort of really dug into the fact that our federal officials are typically appointed for life, including um, our uh, judges is a, a really strong example. And we really don't have a mechanism in this situation to remove federal judges who are cognitively impaired. What we have seen is the different circuits have taken approaches to in introducing monitoring, providing resources, and asking judges to step down. Um, obviously, we have situations with the presidencies now where our presidents continue to increase in age, um, and there's mechanisms, the mechanisms there to evaluate and monitor an individual's uh, illness during their presidency is, is questionable. And in fact, we have a pretty nice long history of presidents who had uh, medical conditions during their presidency, which could have actually interfered with their ability to complete the job. And then the last example I'll use is that our congressmen and women um, also have, there's, there's a lack of ability to really remove them from office. But really what these two examples highlight isn't necessarily a problem in either of these two industries, but something that we should think about more broadly about, does it matter whether how we treat somebody, whether they are in a non-safety industry versus a safety industry, and how do we define what a safety sensitive industry is? So you could argue that a teacher with cognitive impairment um, is as troubling as, for example, a pilot or a bus driver. Uh, you obviously have the example of physicians who are working um, later in life as well. Uh, but is that any different than, for example, you know, um, would, you know, an accountant or an, a lawyer would, you know, would you want to know that your accountant or a lawyer um, was in the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease when you were taking their advice? 
And in fact, when we talk to our HR managers, this is the one scenario where they almost all consistently flipped their perspective. So when we gave them the three scenarios, two were sort of standard typical jobs. Um, one was, a, I think, a professor, the other was a car salesman. And the minute we said pilot, they then felt that they had a different sense of obligations to the employer because of the safety component. So here our HR manager says, because it's a safety sensitive sort of position, I do think I have an obligation to look into it. And when we've talked to caregivers of patients with um, early age of onset Alzheimer's disease, the, ask, the component of safety and liability in employment has actually been a part of their process and concerns. And so this is a wife of a, an individual who um, was a civil engineer. And she went on to say that at the time that he started experiencing early symptoms, they started to recognize that there might be liability. And so he ultimately ended up disclosing to his partners because he felt that he should no longer be signing off on um, drawings and whatnot because of the safety issues there. So again, back to this question of what is the likelihood that an individual would actually experience dementia, or I'm sorry, discrimination. So we actually asked early onset caregivers about how the employment, how ending employment decisions um, came about. And we had really two examples. One where there was this very vague and informal process, um, you know, where the, the employee, the individual ended up leaving on her own, but um, it, it sort of felt like it wasn't really an option, um, but they, they came to a mutual agreement. And then the other was that there was this really sort of sense of unfair treatment um, referring to a teacher who had, you know, continued to get uh, bad reports um, on the work that she was doing and what was being pushed to do these programs to improve her teaching. And what the husband really struggled with was like, this was, was a teacher that was, had been there for um, a really long time and nobody recognized that like there was something going on here that might have been more just than they have extended beyond that performance. So as I've muddled through all of this work, um, trying to get a sense of how do I put this in a way that we could actually improve policy to both provide protections without adversely affecting employers. What I've ultimately come up with is, is this sort of scale, if you will, um, where we really have to start to think about at what point in the disease process does somebody qualify for different, under different prongs of the ADA um, and what types of expectations for the employer would that then yield? And additionally, when employers have defenses, this undue hardship or direct threat, how does that then change and shift um, throughout the um, disease process? And so what we can really see is that early on, it's really gonna be unlikely that an employer is gonna be able to argue that there's a direct threat or there's an undue hardship, um, in part because the person would not be able to make a reasonable accommodation claim, but also just because the, even if there was reasonable accommodations, they would likely be minor. But as the illness increases, those, those abilities to access those defenses will also increase, but at the same time, the individual is going to become less qualified. So um, I am in the, the weeds with this topic, really um, trying to figure out how I want to move it forward and what I think will be the focus of maybe a future grant um, and hopefully some level of intervention. And really looking forward to your comments and feedback, because I think that they'll be enlightening. Right now, we're continuing to sort of pull apart at this question of how do individuals make decisions related to employment and how do they perceive discrimination across the disease process. Um, and then starting to look at different ways that we might be able to create policy or protections, including, you know, should we add Alzheimer's disease as a presumed disability? What would that mean and what would that trigger? Are there tools that we can provide to clinicians to help guide making these decisions? Um, are there questions that we should be able to have provide or guidelines to provide to employers for how to provide reasonable accommodations um, without creating a direct threat? And how do we li evaluate liability issues or harm that result from employees with cognitive impairment and where does that liability stand? I, of course, must say thank you. Um, I don't do this work alone. I am incredibly grateful to have um, wonderful funding to support this. I've been able to work with some really young and emerging researchers um, and research assistants. And then also I've got two fantastic mentors and an entire mentorship team that support and provide guidance. And this is the Memory and Aging Center from about 2016. Um, we've grown a little bit since then. I will go ahead and stop share and then I would love to answer questions.
I see a question from Julie and then I think Kate, I don't know if that's a clap or a question. It's a clap and I have a question. Okay, so we'll start with Julie. Hi, uh, thank you for that presentation. That's wonderful. I'm Julie Bynum. I'm a geriatric medicine physician and I head up our new NIH funded center for population research in Alzheimer's. And Jason Carlewish is a close colleague and collaborator. So I'm delighted you're working with him and I know his skill set. I want to thank you for taking on this area from a legal perspective. Um, your presentation was fascinating and, and really helps setting how a different discipline looks at this condition and how it fits into the structures of your own field. So I have a, a question and also just a, a comment. Um, the question is within the legal field, the world of scholarship in legal, how, how much energy and enthusiasm is there for addressing these issues that are such a huge issue moving mm -hmm. forward, looking at the population. The second is a, is a comment about how you think about prioritizing your work. I, I find that, and Ken Langa is on as well, we, you know, we find the whole biomarker issue profoundly intriguing from so many different angles. And it's so important looking forward for evolving ideas. That said, what seems like the urgent, critical, real-time major issue for us is the issue of aging into cognitive decline and people mm -hmm. in the workforce and what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder you know, how you prioritize your future work, putting that in mind, I think intellectually and the future, the interest of biomarkers is sort of a hot topic that I'm sure lots of people will be energetic about, but the really difficult pragmatic issues of how you consider the evolution of cognitive function as someone ages and how that mm -hmm. interacts with age discrimination mm -hmm. as opposed to <laughs> cognitive decline and how you know decisions about retirement, when does that become a disability with somebody's 72 still working, eligible to retire, yet it's their cognitive function that pushes them out mm -hmm. when they're in a thinking field like a professor or a physician. Um, <laughs> I just um, I just would love to hear sort of how you think about those two things. Yeah, sure. So um, I, uh, the first thing, the first question about the legal field, you know, it's interesting. I chose the career path that I did and put, placed myself in the memory and aging center in part because I felt the, um, and I think Kate sees this as well, is the, the legal field, um, and frankly, sometimes bioethics tends to be, you know, 10 steps behind the medical field. And so we tend to react rather than try to plan ahead and try to predict what's gonna come down. I think that that's changing, frankly, with our generation of researchers who really do really want to see and prevent um, and use C laws more of a tool and overcome some of the barriers that it creates for medicine. So uh, you're starting to see more and more people talking about this issue. When I started in 2011, nobody had really thought about it. Um, but now we have researchers like Emily Largent who works very closely with Jason who thinks about issues of stigma um, and others who are starting to think more closely about it. I absolutely agree with you. There's, you know, there is this ongoing tension that I've identified kind of between neurology and geriatrics about how do we focus on biomarkers and it's something that's been really evident in my career <laughs> really from the get-go because depending on which group I talk to they focus on different issues or they highlight the importance of different issues I think you know to me in some ways they kind of go hand in hand because biomarkers are becoming more readily accessible that we have to sort of think about how that fits in but I do think that there's something about this like middle group of people who are you know somewhere between like it's hard to tell at this stage, are we aging naturally or you know, as a sort of a natural outcome of aging and that, you know, the things that you hear people say, like they just typically, you know, your memory impairment a little bit to these like very mild or subtle cognitive impairment. And how do we think about the employment discrimination in that context, um, particularly when we already have issues of age discrimination. So, um, and I think that that's, there's, there's definitely some meat there for me to continue to pull apart. So I appreciate that refocusing. Uh, Kate, and then Ken. Sure, yeah, so thank you. So this was incredibly interesting. I'm, I'm not at all familiar with the Alzheimer's disease clinical or legal literature. Um, so I guess coming, thinking about your talk from the, from the perspective of being familiar with the genetics, discrimination, laws and regulations, right? So there's like these three buckets of how we protect people against discrimination. You know, as you know, is one sort of like protection against compelling disclosure mm -hmm. of a potential disability, 
And then two, if the person has already already has the information that they pretend or they will or they do have a disability, sort of protection against them being asked about it and having to share that information. So we have a lot mm -hmm. of protections like in job interviews and stuff. And then the third is if the employer actually knows about the disability protecting the person from discrimination once the employer knows. And obviously that's the hardest thing to actually protect against in regulations because it's hard to regulate that. Um, but then I think you made this great point about like the safety, the safety sensitive industries um, and how that's a little bit different in genetics versus sort of Alzheimer's, right? Because in genetics, when we're talking about discrimination, the cost, the risk is to the employer of having to pay for further accommodations. But in Alzheimer's disease, your point was that like the cost is the employer is accepting it on behalf of the customer, whether it be the patient or the person who's mm -hmm. flying in the plane. And so I was wondering that given these additional safety concerns, whether these should be two different kinds of laws, like should we, like, should we be more sympathetic to compelling disclosure of biomarkers related to mm -hmm. Alzheimer's? Um, like, does that change your assessment? Yeah, it's an interesting question because, you know, in the paper that I've drafted out, I, I start with like this like sort of barrier question of like, well, how is the employer gonna find out? And when we did our interviews with HR managers, we sort of came up with three hypothetical scenarios because what I have found in this field is that people are really readily like interested in disclosing their medical information and they do it in ways that they don't realize, right? So, you know, the, I think the examples we used is joining a Facebook group that related to, you know, preclinical Alzheimer's disease or leaving out a pamphlet that talks, you know, about Alzheimer's disease on your desk um, or just straight, you know, flat out disclosure where people are trying to be honest. And one of the questions is, you know, is this something that a future employer could say, okay, so we're going to run you, you know, do the interview process, hire you, but then your pre-employment, like medical eval, which are required at certain jobs to make sure that you're to the job, is going to include either a cognitive assessment or a biomarker assessment. And you could probably make some arguments for the cognitive assessment depending on the job, right? So you could definitely see that in something like the FAA, which the FAA includes that within their assessment. But the, the biomarker question is different because unlike genetics, where that is your you know, trait throughout your life, biomarkers actually tell us a little bit more about your state. So you know, if you're amyloid positive, we know that you're at least within 20 years of potentially experiencing symptoms. But the truth is, is you may never actually develop symptoms. It's, it's just a risk factor in that way. Tau is a little bit different that we think that it actually might be able to tell you where within the disease progression you are. And so I agree with you. I think that like there's something that needs to be done to look at HIPAA and HIPAA specifically in the context of how this information gets disclosed to employers. Then there's almost something that needs to be done for just general protections. But then there seems to be another set of policies that need to be evaluated more when we're talking about safety sensitive industries. The problem I run into there is how do you define what is a safety sensitive industry because like I have yet to come up with a job where I'm like that doesn't that wouldn't lead to the employer accepting risk on behalf of like you said their customer or you know a, you know accepting it that you know we're going to allow a teacher to maintain um, their place in a classroom when they're dealing with children or you know we've heard stories about uh, patients who make massive misordering on stock kind of things right and that's a that's a cost to somebody else. So that's where I've started to struggle. So I appreciate the question. Thank you, Kate. I think I saw Ken had a question up. Nice yeah. to see you, Ken. Yeah, you too, Jelaine, thanks. Um, I think, uh, well, it's not exactly a question, but just sort of uh, raising again what Julie uh, mentioned, and you and I have talked about this before, but something you said in your um, presentation sort of uh, magnified it for me. This is, again, just this issue of, um, what is a biomarker truly a, I think the criterion you called it was impairment of bodily function. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of as a, as a clinician treating older patients, that actually kind of makes me shudder to think of, mm -hmm. uh, of classifying it that way. And again, this is just going back to what you talked about, the, the sort of different uh, perspective between, say, neurologist who, uh, you know, who's uh, measuring these and focused on these for, um, you know, to try to pick up this this risk factor, but um, again, as you said, that 
the issue, and again, we've talked about this before, um, you know, would that have an impact on sort of patients and families' expectations about treatment and what do they need to be doing about this? You know, if they have amyloid in their brain, that uh, seems to be elevated, you know, do they have an impairment in bodily function and how will that change uh, the views on things? Again, I, the, I don't know that there's a question in there, but I'd just uh, be interested in, uh, in the, specifically that that term or that phrase of impairment of bodily function for an, for an mm. for a biomarker abnormality i think is uh, is interesting to try to uh, tease out yeah it's really interesting because um this is where like the hiv like i think i'm one of the few people that was like i'm like a little frustrated about the amendment in 2008 because it screwed up my analysis not that i was analyzing this before 2008 but the case law and before 2008 is a lot easier for me to analyze and to do like a case by case comparison because um, they're looking at HIV specifically as something that affects your immune function, right? And, and you can see actual sort of symptom or clinical outcomes of those impairments. And I think in the list of major bodily functions, you know, I mentioned cancer and cell function, you can see the sort of clinical outcome of why those are important, but, you know, might not be clinically measurable or really sort of raised to another type of um, major, you know, life activity. The issue that I have with the biomarkers and I struggle with is that there's part of me that says, well, if somebody's preclinical ID, like they should not be discriminated against in their employment context because they may never develop symptoms. So like it shouldn't matter. But at the same time, this is where I'm like, is the ADA really the right mechanism? Because I don't think that that's actually... <laughs> I don't think that this is the type of thing that was really the goal of the ADA um, because the, you know, because of the history of like how the ADA came to be, right? It also does provide for things for wheelchair ramps and, you know, the it, braille on signs, these types of things, because those are the individuals who need that to function in their daily lives. Right. And so that's, I think, where the tension comes up for me, both as like an advocate who thinks like the biomarkers are going to have an incredible importance, particularly as we think forward to disease modifying therapies and Alzheimer's disease and other Alzheimer's related dementias. But at the same time, this, this doesn't seem like the right fit. It sort of feels like, you know, the square peg round hole yeah. type of scenario. Yeah, I agree. We have the same tension. So that, that makes me feel, uh, feel good. <laughs> Thanks. And, yeah. And I see Julie has a question, but I can't see um, if anybody else does before we go back to Julie. Okay, we'll go to Julie and then see if any other hands go up. If I can figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I guess that exact point is why um, to me, the ADA fit seems more, it's not so much the issue of hiring because it's such a, usually such a late onset disease, it's an issue of firing. <laughs> mm -hmm. More hiring that seems the more critical one. And in particular, you know, the, so I, for, I uh, am a physician also in a, in a subjective cognitive impairment clinic, I like to say, is this normal aging versus is this disease? Mm -hmm. People are self-regulating when to step away from work or sense because they're usually old enough to retire. But there's also the case where people are being um, evaluated for poor performance. So this is such an undiagnosed disease. The level of undiagnosis is so high that people can come forward through negative work performance evaluations. And then in one particular case, I'm remembering, you know, someone discovered their diagnosis through poor work performance and then wanted to be, you know, is that then disability after the fact? Yeah. Or is that time to retire? You know, that's the conflict that I see right. occurring legally. When is that disability versus? Right. You know, yeah, we've, I've heard similar cases come through and it, and it does like, it's one of the, I think that this is probably one of the reasons why this has been a project I've been working on, you know, just like writing this paper has taken me like two years because every time I sit down to write it, there's always these sort of like corkscrew things that come in. I'm like, well, how does that fit in? And one of them is we have um, one of our pieces of data as a qualitative interview where the spouse is describing a physician who ultimately um, the reason why the physician was evaluated was because of poor performance and some sort of weird or strange uh, behavior, young onset, so not at an age that um, you would expect a physician to start to experience cognitive impairment, you know, late 50s, or early 60s. Um, and so then the question became, 
the struggle that this family had was, you know, they needed the neuropsyche valve, but they wanted a neuropsyche valve to try to get it back to work. And so what do you, you know, is that like, is that what we should be doing if we can like give her the resources she needs to get back to work? But at the same time, you know, there's all of these other weird legal requirements about what, how you qualify for things like social security disability or even disability insurance under your employer. Um, and so people are trying to meet those qualifications for financial reasons after they've learned because of poor performance that they have cognitive impairment. And, and so there's, there is this weird sort of, I don't know, hamster wheel situation or really messy knot of yarn that like, if you pull one thing too hard, everything gets screwed up. And so I agree with you, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I don't, I don't know that that was actually an answer, but just to say like, it, there's that there's something really difficult there, particularly at early stages of the disease um, and in very high functioning people but where their jobs are also cognitively demanding. I see that we have a question from, is that Michael O'Leary? Yeah, that's me. Hi, thanks so much for this presentation. It's really interesting. I was wondering if you could talk briefly, if it's within the purview of any of the prior analysis you've done about if there's any uh, disparities in state law, additional employment protections that might occur at the state level that mm -hmm. might be relevant to this topic, or if that's totally beyond the purview of, of your yeah. work. Now, um, we did a 50 state survey early on, um, and that's actually how we came up across some of the issues in long-term care insurance discrimination. Um, you know, state law is really interesting in part because the federal law establishes the baseline and then states either expand or don't expand beyond it. We haven't done an analysis of the state law related to employment discrimination specifically in part because frankly, the ADA isn't, has been enough for the last three years to pick apart and to try to understand before we venture into the state law question. We do know that there are variations. For example, you see this in the genetics and law literature um, about protections, as well as privacy protections can vary between states. For example, California is one of the few states that has specific privacy um, expectations uh, surrounding research data that don't apply in the medical context. And so it adds, all of these little pieces are gonna add additional layers to how this might affect somebody, you know, differently in New York versus Alabama. Um, I can tell you, you know, sort of a joke in our lab was that if you're concerned about being discriminated against, um, states like Alabama are, are some of the worst because they adopt more or less the bare minimum. And then it's, you know, sort of inter interpretable after that. Um, but as far as how like the disparities would come out beyond knowing who's kept their state laws as the baseline requirement that they need to meet versus expanded beyond them, we haven't done that analysis yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna go back to Julie's point real quick because there's another aspect of it that you raised um, that relates to different aspects of my work, which is we're looking at the questions around criminality and dementia. <laughs> And how does the criminal justice system treat individuals who either commit a crime as a result of their dementia symptoms and or develop dementia while incarcerated? And this question of, you know, what happens if somebody has been arrested and that arrest is actually the first sort of identifiable symptom of their illness, how do you then demonstrate that their behavior in that situation was actually the result of cognitive impairment and not sort of just uh, like a volitional act. And I think that that's, there's like other components within our sort of societal structure where we're thinking about a lot of the sort of abnormal social behavior or poor performance are things that would trigger us, particularly in young onset dementias, um, that something is not sort of okay or there's something else going on, um, but it's getting picked up by a very like legally actionable event, whether that's loss of job, loss of, you know, or a situation like um, being arrested for, a, a, you know, a petty crime or even um, something like battery because of aggression. Jelaine, I wonder if I could ask maybe the last question in the last few minutes that we have. I'm curious to know in the qualitative work that you've done with um, HR managers, if in addition to the thoughts they had about protecting disclosure and how they would react to a disclosure, if your work touched on with them or if they had any thoughts on 
their ideas of potential legal and or policy um, interventions or um, mm -hmm. you know policies that would apply to these folks and what their perspective mm -hmm. on it was. It would be wonderful if they had. Um, you know, we tried to get to that. And I think because they were so adamant that it shouldn't be used, they were really like remiss to like even identify that it would be a problem, except for to say that like, this is not something that like a supervisor or a colleague should know about, but that they wouldn't really know how to address that issue. Um, they definitely reflected sort of some like protected behavior that like, you know, if they found out that, um, I think one of the examples we used was a CEO that, you know, that they would be sure to kind of counsel the employee as best as possible about how to handle that information in the context of um, their future at the company. Um, but they, I think this, you know, and we talked about this a little bit before the talk, it's, there's these really uncomfortable and difficult to identify intangibles that happen in discrimination where individuals either I don't identify that they've actually been discriminated against, you know, so um, Christine, you and I were talking about beforehand how we've both sort of seen these trends of it's very coincidental that our caregivers report that the individual left their job, not because they were terminated, but because the company just happened to be reorganizing, right? Like there's all of these very subtle things that can be done. And in fact, even our engineer, we did two interviews with each um, caregiver. His wife reported like that the, that the buyout process of trying to get him out of his partnership, now this is a partnership, like a small partnership, um, was being challenged because she felt like the partners were smart enough to know how to avoid discrimination, but that they were also trying to take advantage of the situation. So there is something, you know, and what Christine and I were talking about before is like, there's something missing that we need to understand. There's some other research question that needs to be asked to really understand the employment discrimination issue that gets at some of these intangibles to better understand what are the interventions that we need afterwards. I have some general senses of what kinds of interventions would be sort of helpful in the current setting, including I think physicians really do need some better guidance on how to, um, how to have discussions with their patients. And I think employers need better education and training around what dementia and Alzheimer's disease is and that it's not always the, you know, 95 year old that does not remember his grandkids' names, right? Um, that, they're, that that's a stereotyped version of Alzheimer's disease and to better educate the like process throughout. But from a policy perspective, it's hard to understand what the intervention is that we need to implement if we don't truly understand how things are happening on the ground. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, over the course of my career, we can get a better grip on that. And hopefully sooner than, than, than later, I always tell people I'm working on this as fast as I can, but it's just me and Anna right now. So um, I'm looking forward to some collaborations to help me be able to get at this issue in a different way. Well, thank you, Jelaine. That was a wonderful um, presentation, really important and fascinating work that you're doing. And I think um, really look forward to hearing about your future findings and future work. And let's have you back again when you can travel to Ann Arbor uh, to talk to us all so we can meet you in person. Um, it I looks like we're just, we're just at noon now. So I, I think we'll finish up. But again, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much.